All right. So welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Ben, and I'm here with two uh, amazing booktubers. Uh, we've got the first person who needs no introduction in this corner. You got Steve Donahue, uh, the most prolific booktuber by far, I think. Um, I, <laughs> he's right now experiencing some bandwidth issues. Uh, so we're going to hope that uh, we can hear him and see him the entire time uh, and uh, keep our fingers crossed. So. Yeah. <laughs> and we've also got uh, Michael K. Vaughn, um, another fairly, I mean, at least compared to me, he's prolific in making videos, uh, pretty much one a day, uh, definitely the best dressed person on BookTube. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, both of these gentlemen are fellow co-hosts in Book Trek 2021, where we are doing a five-month mission looking at Trek fiction uh, from August to December of this year. And each month we are focusing on a different iteration of Star Trek in production order. So August, we dedicated to the original series. And as August is closing up now, we figured we'd have a quick Zoom chat about just kind of Star Trek in general, some of the fiction. Uh, you know, <laughs> none of us are gonna be, you know, I, I think Steve's uh, knowledge of original series um, is probably pretty unmatched uh, <laughs> aside from the people who were part of the production. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think I've seen all of original series at least once. Uh, most of it I've only seen once though. So my, my memory is going to be pretty rusty. Uh, Michael, is that kind of the same for you? How often have you rewatched a lot of the stuff? Countless times. Okay, I've so seen the, the, every episode of the original series many 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 times in my life yeah so uh, i'm gonna be the weak link here uh, uh you, re you reach a point where you don't remember any longer how long it's been how many times yeah. you've seen it you, yeah yeah you so, reach a I point mean, where go ahead Z. sorry well i have no idea for instance balance of terror i have no idea how many times i've seen that episode no idea at all probably in excess of a thousand times it's just it becomes so much a part of your visual dna that you don't count anymore <laughs> Yeah, True. So, yeah, we're, we're going to just have a general conversation about original series. I do have some guiding questions, but we don't necessarily have to stick to those. We can always bounce around, uh, you know, kind of wherever the conversation leads us. Uh, we're not presenting any of this as experts in Shrek or anything like that, just fans uh, discussing the franchise and the fiction. Um, and that'll be it. Be a very loose conversation and, you know, we'll see where it takes us and I hope everybody enjoys it. Uh, the first question I had uh, for everybody was what is your earliest memory of Trek? Uh, do, do you actually remember when you first saw it? Or maybe you don't remember the very first time, but the first time that it really kind of stuck in your head that this is something that interest, interested you? Uh, you know, it, Michael, you want to get started off? Yeah, uh, it's, well, my mother was a huge Star Trek fan. Mm. So every time Star Trek was on in a rerun, she had it on the TV. So for me, Star Trek has always existed. And I was watching Star Trek as a toddler. So oh, wow. it's hard to say. It's just like one of those things. It's like Batman. He's always been around. It's hard to remember when you first saw Batman. And Star Trek for me is the same way because I remember Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock. That's one of my earliest memories probably watching those guys. So my whole life, I've been watching the original series of Star Trek. I think that's sort of the way it is with my kids right now, except it's a little bit more next generation in my household. Uh, that so I remember the first time I saw. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, ever since my kids were young, we would usually when I'm cooking dinner, I would put on like a Star Trek episode or something. And it came to the point where my kids were in the high chairs, you know, and they're in the opening credits and they know when the ship was going to go into warp, you know, <laughs> and like my kids would like start like going back and forth to the music. And, you know, it just kind of became a part of their daily routine. Um, which is, is great, you know. For, for a little while, my, my son tried to tell me that Star Wars was better, and uh, you know, <laughs> I, I came close to disowning him, but uh, I, I kept him <laughs> a little bit longer. And uh, now he's actually getting pretty excited again when we have Star Trek on the TV. <laughs> Steve, what about you? I remember reading in trade magazines. I wish I could remember the name of. I remember reading in trade magazines stories, articles about an upcoming TV show. I remember distinctly one of those trade magazines said it's it's a spaceship and one of the crew members is a Martian. <laughs> <laughs> and, and many, many trade uh, notices said they, they might not have said Martian, but they said one of the crew members is a green skinned alien. 
I may be going off original, you know, Desi Lu production notes where Spock was supposed to have green skin. Maybe, I don't know one way or another where they got that. They probably copied from each other, but I just rolled my eyes. You know, I was familiar with Lost in Space. I thought this is just going to be really bad. This is, this is just going to be really bad. And, and I'll watch it because I'm a big fan of science fiction, but it'd be painful to do. <laughs> And then I watched, I, I withheld judgment for about a month. And if you were watching the original episodes on TV, it took only a month to realize something very different was going on from anything that had appeared on TV before in American science fiction. Very, very different. Consistent characters, emotional stakes. That had never, that is so common now that 20 something now is going to think, so what? But that had never happened before on TV. Consistent characters and emotional stakes, maybe characters who don't completely like each other. That was unbelievable. I was hooked right away. <laughs> I was hooked right away. I was part of the massive letter writing campaign uh, to save the show from cancellation. We wow. wouldn't even have three seasons if not for that campaign. <laughs> the, the, the network had to learn the hard way, the, the grassroots way, that lots of people love this show. Uh, through letters, many, many letters say, sent into the studio saying, please don't cancel this show. The 21st century, it would be social media messages, and they would start with, please don't cancel this show, and they would immediately switch to, this is where your daughter goes to elementary school, right? <laughs> because, because in the 21st century, we're all monsters. <laughs> it would be, don't cancel this show, or I'll kill you. <laughs> But back then, it was just don't cancel this show. That's all it was. It was just don't cancel this show. <laughs> but they did the next best thing. They moved it to a death slot. Uh, uh, they moved it from its original airing show and time and day to a, a, a time and day when it was up against the highest rated show on TV. It was never going to succeed. It was... Uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, it's main uh, target. It's around this point that yeah. everybody's yeah. hoping my audio goes out. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know that when they switched that time, the main target demographic for the show was not at home watching television at that point. Um, so I, I remember Neil deGrasse Tyson saying something about, uh, you're talking about how different it was, uh, just even just the Enterprise itself, where previous sci-fi, you had like a rocket ship and it was designed to go from point A to point B. Whereas the Enterprise was just continuing on its mission and it didn't look like anything yes. that had ever come before, you know, uh, it just this right. revolutionary concept. Right, even even the ship uh, in Lost in Space looked like a flying saucer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it didn't look like the Enterprise looks more like a city <laughs> that is traveling through space, and the you know where the saucer is part of it, <laughs> but but not all of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah so, and I'm my so experience would have been completely different. I watched that TV. I'm watching you now on a Star Trek uh, Vizzy screen. Yeah, right in the personal quarters in Kirk's quarters, he has a little screen that it has instantaneous visual communication with people elsewhere on the ship. We're doing that right now. Yeah. But when I watched it originally, it was on the TV that was part of the furniture. The thing cost $500. It was set in mahogany. It had a gigantic wooden top to it. And I was sitting cross-legged on the floor surrounded by beagles. <laughs> so everything has changed. <laughs> I think going back and watching reruns, it's easy to forget uh, because we're so used to that technology now that this was completely oh, yeah. unheard of, you know, that that was science fiction. It's now science reality, you know? I mean, it, even when I watch, you know, I remember watching Next Gen and, uh, you know, the fact they're using data pads, um, something that, you know, we use every day now in our daily life. And when I go back and watch those reruns, I forget that that didn't exist, yeah. you know, <laughs> when they were watching, when they were, when I was watching those yeah. originally. Um, we're so, it, I was so used to, I'm so used to the Starship Enterprise that, it's hard to really know how weird it must have looked when it first yeah. showed up. <laughs> yeah. It's a beautiful looking ship, though. It really it, is. Yeah. Those nacelles but are kind of like the everything fins on a show, all of the concepts. <laughs> ion storms? The, the Earth gets based in ion storms all the time. We now know about that because we can detect them. At the time, that was a science fiction thing. Functional cloning? Yes. It's a concept that's casually dropped in Star Trek. Now we have the Kardashians. <laughs> it's, it's, 
we live in that world. <laughs> I, I didn't necessarily want to point this out when start when Book Trek first started, but I guess I am the youngest <laughs> participant. Uh, you know, I, I came to Trek much later. Um, I my, my very first. I, I remember I was aware of Star Trek. But the first episode that I remember pulling me in, and I realized that this is something that I liked, not a great episode, but it's the Patterns of Force. And I remember being a kid, you know, and sitting, like, I was, my parents had a black and white TV in their room. And uh, I just remember laying in bed, going through the, you know, going through the channel and seeing, like, you know, Nazis on screen and wondering what the heck was going on. And then realizing there was a sci-fi story surrounding this whole thing. And I just remember that was probably one of the first episodes that I really focused in on. It wasn't just something in the background. It was something that I realized that there was, I wasn't, you know, I was in elementary school. I didn't comprehend everything. Uh, but, you know, it kind of introduced me to, um, you know, not just the sci-fi stuff, but also certain things with like World War II. Uh, that was kind of one of my earlier exposures to, you know, uh, attitudes towards fascism or, you know, things like that. Uh, and that's when I really started paying attention, I think, to the episodes when they were on. Um, you said I was aware of this stuff earlier, just kind of as part of the, you know, miasma from culture <laughs> and pop culture. Uh, but that's the one that really drew me in at a pretty young age. Um, I was dreading that episode. When it was announced, <laughs> I thought, oh, God, Kirk, Kirk fights space Nazis. <laughs> but what is what is our window into that episode the complexity starts a nuance starts right away what is our window into that episode it's not kirk versus the nazis the, the window into the episode is a, an ordinary freedom loving historian who is suborned by nazism john gill mm -hmm. a respected a revered historian all of a sudden the black and white good versus evil is complicated right away because everybody in the show venerates john gill they can't believe he chose this example. And imagine, imagine a show, an episode in which a historian, a non-Nazi historian, chooses the original Nazi years of Hitler's reign as a pattern for a society when a whole bunch of people watching the show lost a father, lost a brother yeah. in the war. When imagine the, the cajoni, the dilithium crystals it took to do that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Even in a, a substandard episode, that is just amazing. It's true. It's recent history. Nothing it's like true. that had happened. <laughs> yeah, it was recent history. Yeah, relatively recent history. Yeah. It certainly it wasn't dead history. And and no nothing like that had ever happened before. <laughs> also, Patterns of Force gave the whole world a concise and infallible method for putting a boot on. <laughs> <laughs> that no one follows. Spark just simply says the right way to put a boot on so that you will <laughs> never fail. It will always work. But no one does it. <laughs> Even after all this time, we've had a completely logical way to put a boot on your foot without fighting with it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> so I mean, patterns are forced. Like I said, it's not a it's not a great episode. Uh, I mean, it, th that's the, when you know in season two you start seeing the trend of like we have these other costumes on the lot that we need to yeah, use. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, they need to go fight gangsters. They need to, you know, we need to go back to ancient Greece. <laughs> um, but that can lead to great episodes. Yeah, sometimes it does. Sometimes it's it does. All about the writing. <laughs> Patterns of Force isn't an example, but a piece of the action is a classic episode. Yeah. You're right. They just had a gangster back set lot, yeah. <laughs> but it's it, they made a classic episode out of it. And I have a soft spot for bread and circuses for going the enterprise goes to ancient rome i have a soft spot that was the episode that did it for me that was the episode that where i said all right i don't know what's going to happen to this thing on network tv but i am never going to forget this show i'm going to remember it for the rest of my life and it wasn't the action it was the scene between mccoy and spock in prison where they start just going at each other because they're both worried about captain kirk <laughs> such a, a completely emotional moment it had nothing to do with furthering the plot it was simply character i just was mesmerized absolutely mesmerized where the characters the mccoy and spark are distinct the whole time in the scene and yet <laughs> i just loved it that was that was when i knew that was the first moment that i felt the magic of star trek for me yeah those are some of my favorite moments is the mccoy spock uh tension like in the tholian web you know that sort of thing uh, oh yes <laughs> michael yeah. what were some of the uh, episodes that really stuck out to you well the episode i've always remembered the most 
And it might have been the one, it was a muck time. Mm -hmm. Iconic you music. <laughs> yeah. Dun it, 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 bump, 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 bump. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, when my brother and I, when we were little kids, we would play Star Trek because that's what kids do. And one of us was always, da 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 bump, bump, bump. It would do the, the Captain Kirk roll, you know. You ripped your shirt too. You, you had to rip your shirt somehow. <laughs> yeah, it always had the shoulder. Yeah. You always had to have the shoulder ripped. But uh, yeah, that was the one I remember the most from being a little kid, just because it was, it was just great. You got a great insight into Spock, his relationship with Captain Kirk. You got to see, yeah, he really does care about these guys. He does have emotions. He just keeps a lid on it because he's a Vulcan. Mm. Uh, it was fascinating to me. Uh, and yeah, that's probably still, that might be my favorite episode, maybe. It's, it's hard amazing. to say. It might be. It's an amazing way to start season two. Yeah. <laughs> when it opens up with that. And um, Theodore Sturgeon, the writer of that episode, the episode in which uh, the, the betrothed have to fight to the death in order mm -hmm. to have a wedding ceremony. He got that from my second marriage with Deb. <laughs> you know, like, this is too good to waste. <laughs> so I never got married. I mean, why take the chance, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. a knife you, you think everything's yeah. going fine, and then somebody will walk up and say, Kuna Kali Fe. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there goes the ceremony. <laughs> uh, a lot of a lot gets talked about with like the most famous episodes you got like city on the edge of forever and you know uh, what are some Mark of the ones I. that are underrated for you guys that you don't actually think get talked about enough steve i'm sure you got a whole plethora of these is there is there one that one of my favorite you feel like only you like from that much <laughs> maybe not only me but uh but requiem from methuselah mm. where they meet flint the immortal who was <laughs> Brahms and Da Vinci and whatnot, and who's building the perfect woman <laughs> in his laboratory. <laughs> I don't think you could do a so like that at all today, but, and it's cheesy and it's, it's driven entirely by coincidence, but I still, I still love it. I still absolutely love it. <laughs> so, it has, it has and it also has a classic Spock McCoy moment, right? The three of them are at the door to Kirk's, to, to Flint's workshop they don't know what they've already been threatened by his technology they don't know what's on the other side of that door it could be very dangerous kirk of course wants to charge right in <laughs> spock gets in the way physically and says let me go in first and they're just looking at him and spock says there may be danger within and and mccoy is on him right away he doesn't care about the mission anymore he just cares about sh spock is showing love mm. and then there's a pause and then kirk very delicately says we'll all go. So even in the middle of a, what I admit is a substandard episode, there's still a fantastic character moment. Yeah. Just fantastic. That is just perfectly done. I have to believe that if the script is not serving them, that a lot of that came from the actors. Just thinking, we'll pour our heart and soul into this because this is good character work. <sighs> yeah, that's a fun episode. That's it for me. It's, Requiem for Methuselah is it for me. It kind of, it's a little bit reminiscent of uh, Forbidden Planet too, isn't it? Kind of like the certain conflict with the like this jealous father figure almost and you know <laughs> the woman and yeah it's classic sci-fi still um what about you michael is there one that you it never makes like the top one, 10 lists but that you really like <laughs> the one that it might not be the greatest episode but i liked it an awful lot and it was actually pretty good i think was the salt vampire in the uh <laughs> <laughs> was it the man trap is that what the episode is called the man trap yeah yes. yeah and mm -hmm. the thing that i remember what it was just so creepy to me when i was a kid and as a when i was younger just the idea of this dude now this monster killed his wife right <laughs> and he's stuck on this planet with this monster who could be anybody he wants it to be and it's just, just something so creepy about that and he ah it was just creepy to me and the monster itself was just creepy how it impersonated mccoy and they're all sitting in the briefing room later and mccoy's like the fake mccoy's like oh yeah it's just going on and it's just like ah, just something about it got under my skin i think yeah. my favorite moment from that episode is when uh mccoy's talking about how the woman that he's loved she hasn't aged a day 
Right, right. <laughs> and Kirk sees her as, you know, somebody who's clearly like a middle-aged woman. He's just like, she's certainly handsome. <laughs> you know, it's like she's 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 fine, you know. <laughs> but yeah, it's terrific. And, uh, and the other crewman and the other crewman who dies five seconds later was just ogling her. Yeah. yeah. Isn't, does, isn't there a isn't there like a red shirt that tastes something like off the ground on the point? Yeah, I just, that, that was the yeah. story. Yeah, just he just put this poisonous plant in his mouth. You know, <laughs> weird, but he did. <laughs> but even yeah. there, even in that episode, we yeah. get nuance. Yeah. You feel for that monster. It's not a monster at the end. It's an endangered species. Mm. The man who's lost the most to the monster is the one calling for its preservation, saying this is like the buffalo. That, that even in that episode you still i don't know that you can say that about like cat's paw is widely considered the worst star trek original <laughs> series episode. Episode, yeah. i'm not sure there's anything in there that's salvageable <laughs> but in the man trap absolutely absolutely there is <laughs> that brings up something that i think is kind of interesting about the original series that um i don't i don't know if it gets talked about a lot but you know this comes right at the in the midst of like monster kid culture um you know, you had the you know, the Aurora model kits, right? Uh, you would have like, the, the shock theater in the 50s. So, like, there's kind of like certain Monster of the Week episodes with Star Trek. And they're, they're fun. They're great. I mean, I love that kind of stuff. But it kind of makes me think of it was a whole different attitude, I think, going into the original series. Then by the time you get to Next Generation and thereafter, you no longer have the monster kids that are going through. Mm-hmm. I think they're, they're a little bit less... Uh, susceptible or likely to kind of go a horror route. Where I think original series kind of did like mini horror movies a lot of times. Um, you know, at least as Every far once as in a while, yeah. Are. The next generation only goes the horror route once in a while, most famously to kill off Tasha Yar. <laughs> well, and they had the uh, <laughs> <episode> <laughs> conspiracy about like the the worms that were taken over <laughs> the admirals and everything right. like that, uh, which was just right. deemed too horrific for television. Uh, you know. Boy, though, I remember those model kits. I got one of those model kits of uh, the Wolfman. Nice. And I was, I was so ready. I bought it with hard earned money. I was so ready to, you break the pieces off from their plastic scaffolding and you put them together and you glue them and then you color it. I was so ready to enjoy the long, patient process of that. And I had six beagles at the time, and I don't think they left a single piece uneaten. They just yeah. ate the whole thing. <laughs> Every bit of it. I, it was all gone in no time at all. That's a <laughs> and not only, it was insult to injury. Because not only did I have to watch while they just tore it all apart, but I had to pick it up when it came out the other end. <laughs> I, my beagles are the reasons I could never have good things. <laughs> I could never have models. I could never play board games. <laughs> I could never do anything like that. <laughs> In the next generation, you've got an, an old universal set monster on the bridge. You've got Lieutenant Worf on mm. the bridge. That, yep. it's, things started to blur by that point. They started to blur. And also monsters started to become inaccessible. Those old Aurora model kits could build you something that looked a lot like the monster you saw on the screen. Nothing can make you, you can't build an alien from the movie Alien. There's, there's no way that you can do that, that it'll look anything other than just dumb. Yeah, I mean, the, the special the effects kits, started to make the model kits look, look sort of dumb. Yeah, those I old think. Universal monsters were generally much more sympathetic. Um, maybe not Dracula, but the Frankenstein monster and Wolfman and uh, creature from the Black Lagoon. Uh, I think kids were identifying with sympathetic monsters in the early 1960s, uh, not necessarily in the 80s. Uh, you didn't see that. And I, it was slashers, and that's not somebody to sympathize with. <laughs> uh, I no. think the episode that I, speaking of, it's a little bit of a horror episode, but uh, the one that I've always liked that never gets talked about is uh, Dagger of the Mind. Uh, I always thought that Dr. Helen Noel was such an awesome character. Um, I'd be curious if there was any Trek fiction about her, but oh, I mean, she's, she, she's like an equal as far as Kirk in like, you know, a certain sexual magnetism <laughs> that they have. Like she seems to intimidate him actually, <laughs> you know, in, in, a, in a certain like sexual manner, uh, but she ends up holding her own, you know, in it. She's smart. She like kicks it, kicks a guy into like the electrical circuits, you know. Um, she, I think, is one of my favorite female characters in all the original series, uh, and I just think that's a, a really fun episode. Um, but I, I don't hear it talked about much at all, unfortunately. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. It was a good one. It's it's Dagger of the Mind and a couple of other episodes that are always on my mind when I 
imagine pitching. I've had an idea for decades to pitch to Paramount. No offense intended to James Blish, but let's have a novel of every original show. Mm. And, and just, and since the Calvin timeline has now left that whole reality behind. There's much less at stake. So let's just these to a writer who wants to do it and let them do what they want with their only instruction being that the continuity in the novel they write has to fit into the continuity of the next episode. But other than that, no, you can do whatever you want and you can connect it in Star Trek lore. Imagine what an episode, what a novel Dagger of the Mind could be. Mm, yeah, absolutely. It would just, just be incredible. You, you know, go to different authors, give them a brief and say, come at this any way you want. It doesn't, you don't have to tell it the way it's told on the screen. Just tell the story, but you can come at it any way you want. I bet there'd be a way even to save Cat's Paw if you gave it to the right writer. Yeah, yep. I don't know if there's <laughs> any just will not do. brain. You'd, you'd really have to. <laughs> brain, brain, what is brain? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, there's so a way i'm sure there must be a way how? <laughs> I, 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 I don't have any idea i don't have so, any idea i i do want to be able to talk a little bit about the animated series and the movies but i think that we should start weaving in some of the trek fiction talk into this too um now michael you, you did a pretty fun and kind of hilarious video as far as the gold key comics oh yeah you know, that, that was fun <laughs> clearly uh made by people who hadn't actually seen the show um didn't clearly really know what star trek yeah. was and i left a comment in your video like how it seemed like the first 10 years of trek fiction or media that wasn't on screen was just a complete wild west uh yeah. you know they just wanted stuff that we saw it with some of the toys right? the, the spock helmet and you know uh wh whatever you can throw a star trek brand on you might as well do um now steve you followed the fiction all through from the very beginning right before is the beginning there, is there a point where all the you can Matrix say stuff. the fiction actually became good like is there a point where you're like okay this is where it is or no <laughs> no the the only thing that happened is that it became domesticated it <laughs> okay. stopped being wild west the the only that was the only thing that happened is that it started adhering to a series bible whereas the earliest novels did not <laughs> did not at all and I think that was to the benefit of the fiction. It didn't make the novels any better, but it made them less offensive. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't like that word. Obviously, I don't like that word, but I also don't want to pick up a Star Trek novel that is just the sexual fantasies of the author. And novel after novel after novel, that happens until finally a bigger set of lawyers stepped in and said, you can't do that anymore. I mean, there's, there's hardly an, an, an old, unregulated Star Trek novel in which a female character, and usually it's an Enterprise crew member, is not, you know, naked in the first two chapters. The, the male characters make body rating comments. Mm. <laughs> Kirk and Spock and or Kirk and McCoy and Scotty will make. It, <laughs> if, if the price I have to pay for getting rid of that kind of adolescent crap in my Star Trek fiction is for Star Trek for me to be straightjacketed. I don't know. I'm largely willing to pay that. To yeah. Pay that price. yeah. No. Why, why do you? Why do you think that was? Why? Why do you think the books were like that? I mean, it seems that's not what I would go to Star Trek for. So was well, it the just the time when they were written? No, or no. It's it? the fan fiction. All of the fan okay. fiction is like that. And the earliest books were were born out of fan fiction. They were made by people who had been writing the fan fiction. And the, the fan fiction is all like that. The fan fiction is all rape and torture <laughs> oh geez <laughs> almost all of it huge mountains of it are i mean you'll get you'll get occasionally there'll be something that's really really good uh a science fiction author who has a booming career right now <laughs> who, uh wrote a fan fiction story entirely set in the in the culture of the gorn <laughs> where humans hardly appear at all and it was fantastic. He has disavowed it. He doesn't want anyone to say what his pen name was. He doesn't want to know anyone to know that he wrote it. But that was really good. But for every one story like that, you got a hundred where it was just Spock being tortured for 40 chapters with no clothes on or Kirk being tortured for 40 chapters with no clothes on. <laughs> and those, those gimmicks continue well into published mainstream Star Trek fiction in novels. Until finally, 
somebody stepped in and said, look, this is a multi-million dollar property. The fiction can't be like this anymore. You can't, it can't be like this anymore. <laughs> so. now, I'm curious, and I think this might be also kind of like where Michael was going with the question a little bit. Like, is there something about the original series that opened itself up to that kind of fan fiction? I mean, because when I think back to like 1960s television, you know, Trek is kind of sexually mature for a lot of the stuff on there. They're, you know, they deal with it more openly. I and mean, look at what Pon Far. I mean, you have a whole episode about him raging sexually and dangerously and violently. Um, that's not the kind of thing that you saw on television. No, not so, at all. I mean, it, it, do you think that's part of why or people the, ended uh, up kind of glomming, glomming onto those sorts of things? The, in, there's an incredible moment in uh, Errand of Mercy where a brainwashed Chekhov is in the hallway with a captured female Klingon officer. And he, he has his hand clamped over her mouth and he says, you are, you're not human, but you are beautiful. Mm. And it's pretty clear what's going on in that moment. It's not dialogue that's, that's happening mm. in that moment. It was just incredibly shocking for it to be on network TV. Yeah, uh, I agree. But the reason, <laughs> the, you asked for the reason why, there's only yeah. one reason why. A lot of theorists on the show say it was the this, this strong chemistry between Kirk and Spock yeah, I mean, that gave rise to that element in fan fiction. But, yeah. but that is not true. <laughs> There's only one thing that caused that, and it's the it's really weird to say, but it was an unstoppable tsunami of an element, and that was Leonard Nimoy's sexual charisma. <laughs> That's all it was. They read the entire world was Leonard Nimoy's sexual charisma. Weird. For some <laughs> reason, I never noticed that. I... <laughs> but I <laughs> I it doesn't make any sense to me even at the time it didn't make any sense to me but I thought I mean <laughs> he famously got the most fan mail right yes even more than yeah. Kirk from women and, yeah right chronicles of the show always say he got more fan fiction or fan mail but they usually don't describe what a lot of that fan mail was like yeah. <laughs> just triple x rated just triple x rated I never understood it myself <laughs> when I was watching. Mm -hmm. I was saying, okay, uh, Lieutenant Riley? Maybe I would understand. <laughs> but Leonard Nimoy? <laughs> no, I don't get that at all. <laughs> but that happened and fans just could not stop fantasizing about that. That's what I believe. I, I, there's just one theory. But I believe that, that Leonard Nimoy caused Star Trek fan fiction to happen in the first place. I don't think anybody would have written about Captain Kirk otherwise <laughs> yeah uh so if, if we kind of continue on in like the trek timeline here uh did you watch the animated series when it came out i mean it was oh, yeah. towards children but it actually had some really good writing in it although yeah, i think I we got a colorblind colorist sometimes so <laughs> <laughs> filmation was not known for uh, spending a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> I heard that the original cast was doing the voices and I heard that Dorothy Fontana was writing the first episode and that was all I needed. That yeah. was all I needed. So I just, I'd stay, I stuck on after that. <laughs> what about you, Michael? Do you remember watching those? I remember watching those, but I haven't seen them since I watched them the first time. Hmm. And when, was, right when did they come out? It was, it was the early seventies. Early seventies. Right? Yeah. yeah. But am I right in thinking that they did not get syndicated the way the original show did? I don't remember seeing them on television. I didn't yeah. see them until like they were on like Netflix or something. You there know, were years where you could not turn on a TV without encountering a syndicated rerun of the original show. Yeah. But I don't remember that being true for the cartoons. Yeah, I mean, it, it. the last time I remember seeing the cartoon was when I was a little, little kid watching them on TV. And I, I don't know what year they, they came out, but uh, I was just very small. And that's the last time I saw it, so. I remember there were some oddities, like Chekhov wasn't in it, right? And there was some alien that was in Chekhov's place. Rx, Lieutenant yeah. Rx. She was didn't they have the feline species? Didn't they have, or something, right? <laughs> yes, didn't they have there was Lieutenant Mores, who was a cat. That's yes, right, yeah. <laughs> Steve was not pleased. Yeah. <laughs> and didn't they have belts that like gave them an atmosphere or something? Yeah. They yeah. go out on top of the Enterprise. like Right, and, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they can breathe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because if the 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 the, uh, the belt, you can just add to the model, the visual model of the character. Yeah. Whereas a spacesuit, you'd need a new visual model, and that's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> that's an extra seventy five dollars. So you don't want to do that. <laughs> and then the me as soon as that happened, 
the official continuity of the show had to incorporate both Mares, the cat lieutenant, and Arix, who has three arms. I, all of a sudden, they had to be incorporated into the show. It seems like the, the episode that fiction goes back to the most is the one about Spock's childhood, right? Where he has that, uh, I forget what the, the creature is called, his, um, his pet. Sailor. The the sailor. Sailor. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And the, the adult Spock has to go back in time. Uh, but that one I see referenced quite a bit in Trek fiction. Yeah. Yeah, it's a wide, by yeah. a wide margin the best mm -hmm. animated series episode of them all. That, that, <laughs> the one that was written by Dorothy Fontana as a direct callback to something that she introduced in Journey to Babel. That, that great moment in the original series where oh, McCoy is talks to about his pet. Yeah. Dirt on Spock. He wants <laughs> something to hold over Spock. And Spock's mother says he was fond of a, he had a, a pet sailor, kind of a fat teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> and DeForest Kelly plays it perfectly. McCoy just lights up with joy because he, he suddenly learned that Spock had a teddy bear. <laughs> He has to be told they were alive and they had six inch fangs. <laughs> so after uh, the animated series, there was talk about doing a Star Trek phase two. Well, first there was going to be a movie, then a phase two. They were going to like, re I think they even did almost like a pilot episode or they did like uh, certain, maybe it wasn't a complete episode, but I know they filmed some certain things for it. But then of course it ended up turning into Star Trek, the motion picture, which is not only a big event as far as Star Trek movies are concerned, but also Star Trek fiction. Uh, this is kind of like, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, Steve. This is kind of when the lawyer phase starts with fiction, right? Yeah. And that's with Gene Roddenberry's own novelization of the movie, right? Um, yeah. So, it, Michael, were you reading Trek fiction at all during this time? Yeah, I was. That might have been the time when I read the most. Was in my when I was 11, 12, 13, around then. Did uh, you both so, see the original movie in the theaters? Yeah, I wasn't alive. You weren't yeah, alive. I did. I saw it. I was I was right there in the front, and uh, I remember I remember thinking it was okay. The motion picture is an okay movie, uh, but there was movie. that yeah yeah there was that scene where like the long scene where they're floating around the giant Enterprise, and that was impressive seeing it on the big screen when you're young. It's impressive I for remember. the first like ten minutes of it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It did go on. Yeah. went on yeah. yes indeed <laughs> it went on <laughs> um, i don't know what to say about that sequence it's it's it renders me speechless even now <laughs> i don't know what to say just, that was just roddenberry insisted on it that's all yeah. it's just if gene roddenberry if you're making a star trek movie and he's on set and he insists on something it happens so <laughs> so michael do you remember as a kid going from watching the reruns to watching the movie like what your reaction was as far as like the aesthetic changes and seeing also these guys older, did that like make an impression? You know, at the time they, they were older, but they weren't, they didn't seem that much older. They tried to hide it in yeah. the first movie. Yeah. Um, I, they all, they all were completely recognizable, you know, and stuff like, so their being older didn't really register that much. What was, I liked seeing them all again. The thing that annoyed me the most were the terrible uniforms. The uniforms were terrible, <laughs> just so bad. They were just so bad. And it just didn't, there was a lot of it that didn't feel like Star Trek. Just the way it, it was just slowly paced. There was just a lot of, it just didn't feel like Star Trek a lot of the ways until yeah. they actually, interacted like when spock and kirk would interact that stuff felt like star trek so there was a bit of that in there that i was like okay this is what i came to see but overall i was disappointed i remember that I remember being disappointed overall in the film like i was glad that they were back but it was just like eh, you know and i was really confused by the klingons in the beginning you know because they were suddenly look completely different than the klingons I had been used to and no explanation for years um <laughs> i remember yeah i was disappointed in it i remember when star trek 2 came out then i was overjoyed <laughs> that was incredible i remember just thinking how incredible that was when i saw it like three times in the theater yeah yeah the motion picture is it's an odd movie yeah you no know, it's yes it's slow 
I think it's actually got some really good stuff in there, though. Like, mm-hmm. it's actually a really good sci-fi movie, but it's a weird Star Trek movie. Yeah. In a lot of ways. Um, yeah, it's a Star Trek movie that was made by someone who was really, really impressed with 2001. <laughs> yeah, no, really. It's more like 2001, is it? certainly, mm-hmm. than it is like Star Wars or anything like that. Um, which I kind of, you know, part of me, I like how Trek was taking a different path at that time. I'm not sure audiences were as pleased. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in that moment. Uh, Steve, what do you remember about that time, both in terms of like fiction and also the movie coming out? And... I was overjoyed, just overjoyed. Before the movie came out, I was, of course, was collecting comic books. <laughs> and for a couple of months before the movie came out, the, the full page color ad on the back of every DC comic was the poster for the movie. I remember that, yeah. With the original cast yeah. on the bottom and a glorious enterprise right in the middle of the show. Right. And I, I saw that I saw that that ad on the back of those comics a million times a month and was just it was a dream come true to have to have Star Trek back was a dream come true there were many many years when I did not when I and a whole bunch of other people just did not believe it would ever happen we didn't count the animated series (laughs) it it was just a dream come true and uh, the movie's uneven <laughs> it's an uneven experience it, it won my heart with when scotty gives kirk a tour of the enterprise but i don't know if that's not just the, mu- the music it could just be john williams score right there it's just so unbelievable that <laughs> maybe that did it uh i didn't uh, watching the movie as a star trek fan was a hard thing to do kirk is out of character For the most part mccoy is out of character spock is totally out of character he doesn't go into character at any point in the movie we don't we don't recognize Chekhov. We don't recognize Doctor Christine Chapel. We don't recognize Uhura except for one line, where she tells off a crewman. <laughs> and Kirk also seems to be the bad guy. I mean, Will Decker is not is not a bad captain. He's, he's full like he's of trying dreams. to take the ship back from him. Yeah, Kirk just yeah. takes it over from him, and he's when he takes it over from him, gives the crew no time to react. Doesn't get to know them. Doesn't get to know the ship just assembles the whole crew in the recreation room and tells them what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. It just, it seemed off to me as Star Trek. And boy, oh boy, was that compensated with Star Trek 2, <laughs> where you get just, <laughs> you get 110% Star Trek right from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Just awesome. <laughs> and kind of what I alluded to before, Star Trek 2 embraces their aging more. Uh, I, I think, Steve, one of the things that you've talked about in your book Trek videos, I think is, really interesting and i'd like to know if it is unprecedented uh having these characters being played by the same actors and actually having their aging be a part of the whole story yeah is that is that unprecedented as far as you know i don't know nothing like that would ever happen certainly in in science fiction on tv nothing like that would ever happen but i'm also thinking of non-science fiction i in my on my channel i mentioned gilligan's island for instance or i love lucy or bewitched where there's no sense you could be watching for other you know bonanza is a perfect example we watch the cartwrights on the ponderosa there's never any mention of the fact that we've been watching them for 10 years that's never worked into the show at all They're, they are eternally the age we met them or the avengers that's the, the show ends our characters are still the same but all of a sudden we're getting we're getting you know our same characters only uh, huge chunks of their life have passed but we know nothing about and that continues right up to the end, right? In Star Trek Generations, which I guess we could call the last original Star Trek show. Yeah. We know that we suddenly learn out of nowhere that Sulu has a grown daughter who's in Starfleet. <laughs> That's a, another pure example of how every time in the, the movies are constantly making aware, us aware of the fact that we don't know anything about these characters anymore, which is what happens when you make them leave the ship. <laughs> right yeah. if the cast is on a ship then you are following them around on that ship they can't have an outside life because they're on board a ship <laughs> but but once that's over with they can marry divorce grow old become disillusioned all over again <laughs> i just recently rewatched generations two days ago uh, out of curiosity and so much of that movie thematically is about the passing of time you know about how things pass and yeah. you know uh, it, it goes away there is an end at some point it's you know it's always moving uh you can either embrace it or fight against it or you know um so yeah it, it's kind of interesting that this franchise would end up having to embrace those themes 
you know, which again, you, you don't see very often at all. You know, Batman I is in the 30s. <laughs> as a movie, I just love it. I it well, has all sorts of weaknesses, but I just love it as a movie. Yeah. I, I think time, about the original version of the movie. Yeah. In the original version of the movie, uh, uh, Malcolm McDowell's character, Dr. Soren, is that his yeah, name? Yeah, yeah, Soren. Uh, simply shoots Kirk in the back. Mm. And the, the original test audience just said, no, 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 no. We will burn the theater down yeah. if you do that. So they, they had to go in and change it. And it wasn't, it wasn't helped any because McDowell, he's a fantastic actor, but he can't keep his mouth shut. Mm. And he he started telling people, oh, I killed Captain Kirk. And I'm, no, 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 you can't you can't have anybody that says that. <laughs> so, so they had to change it. I'm glad they did. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad they did. <laughs> but I just love it. I love the fact that the Kirk in that movie draws on the the advice of the Kirk in Star Trek the Motion Picture in order to tell Picard, don't let anyone promote you off the bridge of that ship. He didn't learn that lesson. He did let somebody do it. And I think that's wonderfully full circle. Michael, you I think you were going to say something before. I was going to say, you know, you were talking about time and I was going to say time is the fire in which we burn. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think yes, I, unless you're an Elorian, in which case, yeah. no, you're going to live forever. <laughs> that's true. Except us. <laughs> it's a fire in which you'll burn. <laughs> I think that, uh, you know, it, Trek is often compared with other franchises as far as the movies are concerned, but I do think that Trek works better as a television show. Definitely. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the movies Sometimes. are fun, but... <laughs> Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't at all. Fortunately, if it doesn't work well as a TV show, you'll know right away because the main character who's a subordinate officer will nerve pinch your captain. <laughs> <laughs> that happens in the first episode you can be pretty yeah. sure you're watching bad star trek yeah well it's, it's <laughs> trek trek that is taking its cues from the movies rather than from the shows at that point uh it's i, I think a series is trying to be a cinema cinematic experience rather than an actual show uh in those moments um but yeah i mean i think you know one of the things about trek is you know we've had you know i, I think just recently they did like the 800 episode or something like that of star trek i mean you've got hours and hours and hours to build this universe isn't right? star trek day coming up i think in a couple weeks it's yeah in september um you know but i think so much of it is allowing television in that format to have quiet moments and have those character moments you know that i think that you were alluding to before steve um yeah uh it was, i've had like a million people send me clips uh, send me links to the trailer the, for the little video that was put out for Star Trek Day, solely Absolutely trying to wind me up. They were only <laughs> trying to wind me up because the teaser yeah. for Star Trek Day is all Michael Burnham. And then uh, right. every once in a while, some guy named, is it uh, Crane? Uh, <laughs> uh, Kirk, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were just yeah. trying to wind me up. I, my, my viewers do that all the time. They want rants. I noticed it's that. Too, it's too easy. It's low hanging mm -hmm. fruit. <laughs> but We'll, we'll get to Star Trek Discovery and Book Trek 2022. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> All I want to point out for now is that it launched behind a paywall on a cable service and its producers and Alex Kurtzman said, you can't judge how popular it is because, because of Corona. Hmm. It is on a cable service. So they put it, he said, if you put this on a network sh uh, show, a network where ratings can be judged, then you'll see how popular it is. And they did. And the ratings were abysmal, hmm. abysmal reruns of last year's AKC dog show beat it <laughs> just want to point that out that's all the show is objectively hated <laughs> let's uh let's wrap up the discussion of the on-screen original series uh, before we get to <laughs> I would certainly I'm surprised there isn't a hook that's coming like that <laughs> uh, as far as I think uh <laughs> Well, Steve, you had mentioned that Star Trek Three, I think, is your favorite movie, right? One of your book track videos. I want to come back to that, but Michael. What do you? Is it Wrath of Khan for you, or which is the one that you you find yourself maybe going back to the most? Or, well, of the of the Star Trek movies, I think Wrath of Khan is just the best. I don't I don't know how you beat that. Uh, it, just seeing that on the big screen, I remember. And and plus at the end, spoiler alert: Spock right. dies. It is an and amazing did, scene. 
and I didn't know it was temporary. You know, <laughs> no, I none of us did. <laughs> right, none of us knew it was temporary. Not so you know, we were wrecked. I was wrecked when I saw that. Yeah, because I didn't know it was happening. Because you know, at the time we didn't have internet. You know, so you don't know things that are going to happen in the movie until you go and see the movie. And I saw that movie probably because I remember standing in line. So it was probably the first day it came out. And I didn't see that coming. And it just blew me away. And I was just like, oh, I was just <laughs> weeping as I was leaving the theater. It's you know? a fantastic and, and scene. It wasn't, it yeah. wasn't just me because I remember looking around like, is this happening? And like everybody was wrecked. Everybody was wrecked. Yeah. yeah. Looking back on that scene, though, I think probably my favorite moment happens right before it the look on Shatner's face mm -hmm. when he suddenly realizes that Spock is not in his chair yeah. McCoy says you'd better get down here yeah you better hurry he doesn't say anything more than that Kirk stands up and immediately knows he has to fight against it because he's Jim Kirk but he immediately knows that moment just sends a chill through me even now after all this time. <laughs> yeah I, I remember uh hearing that it was originally leaked from the script that Spock was going to die in the movie. Hmm. So that's when they added the simulation in the beginning where they're doing the, is it the Kobayashi Maru? I think they're doing right. And so it looks like, you know, the whole crew like dies. So then people would think, Oh, that's what they meant. <laughs> you know, oh. if they came in expecting Spock dying that when they would see well, that. Kurt, scene, Kurt actually says to him, aren't you dead? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. I didn't know that. What about um, so, you, man? What's your favorite movie? Uh, I don't know. It, it is a, I usually like to watch two and three back to back. Um, you know, Basically, it, it, one movie. Right? Yeah, uh, I I do. It, it's it, I can't really choose between the two. Um, you know, I, I think actually four originally used to be my favorite. Uh, well, but it's a humdinger of a movie. It's fun, but it's not enough like Trek necessarily. You know, it's like a fun kind of light comedy. Uh, but there's not enough. You know, I do want to see some space battles in, in my movies, and uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not that. Star Trek Five. Are you sure? No. <laughs> you positive? I've only seen that movie once, and I've actually never had a desire to go watch it again. Uh, Uhura dancing on the sand dunes. I think <laughs> them singing "Row, Row Your Boat" in the beginning—that was an odd choice for a campfire. I thought, <laughs> I thought Star Trek was over. I thought, oh, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's always Star Trek Three. Yeah, hands down. That is, that is a fun one. Fast paced. Yeah, I was, and I was helped in that because it was in theaters uh, when I was in Iowa City, Iowa during the summer, and the movie theaters didn't rotate their content during the summer. Everybody forgot that Iowa City existed because it was a college town. <laughs> so Star Trek Three was literally the only movie that I cared about watching. So I went to it every day. I would go to the, the Olympic sized pool to swim for the afternoon. And then I would go to Star Trek three to the point where I knew every single name in the credits. I knew all of the Klingon that was being spoken. <laughs> I, I, but I feel, I feel certain that I, that did not brainwash me. I think I just love the movie, everything about it, just everything about it. I, uh, from the Klingon commander killing his beloved at the beginning yeah. because she knows too much. Mm -hmm. My favorite sequence in all of Star Trek, the shows, any of the movies, is the stealing of the Enterprise mm. from Star Trek Three? I Absolutely. think that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Watch that sequence alone a million times, and then at the end, it's not just that a battered Kirk who has given up everything just quickly and offhandedly tells Spock, "You would have done the same for me." It's not just that; it's that Sarek, a Vulcan, the most Vulcan of all Vulcans, talking to a high priestess of Vulcan says my logic where my son is concerned is yeah. uncertain unbelievable just mm -hmm. unbelievable that they could be done so well uh, just done so well I, the scene in kirk's quarters when he mind melds with sarah yeah where we get just shatner's right eye to convey the emotion of losing his best friend all over again and it works <laughs> I, just, I love the whole thing i just love it I even i'm love so show. impressed when i watched star trek 3 how it feels like a brilliant way where the writers were able to write themselves out of a corner you know mm -hmm. like you at the when you're at the end of wrath of khan you're like how the hell do you you know of course yeah. everyone spock back how do you do that how do you yeah. you know and just the brilliant moves in that movie <laughs> to yeah. to bring us back to that point where we want the crew back and we want them you know going through the galaxy uh it's really well done um 
it raises questions, of course. <laughs> if Spock has a katra that remembers all of his experiences, then what about Spock's brain? <laughs> <laughs> what about that episode? <laughs> and what does that even mean? What does it even, but who cares if it's so well done? The, this, the scene with, with McCoy and Spock's body where he, he's saying, I don't think I could live, I could stand to lose you again. That, that is just amazing. That's just amazing stuff. Well, now I want to watch the movie that, all over again. <laughs> it makes me think too, you know, going back to this Wrath of Khan real quick, I think one of the biggest myths is that uh, Shatner can't act. Um, yeah. He overacts sometimes. Sometimes he Shatners things up. Uh, but when he needs to deliver in a moment, you know, when he's given the eulogy for Spock, yeah. uh, I still get a little bit choked up, well, <laughs> you know, yeah, but, watching listen, that. It, the 21st century has reduced acting to you know, Oscar grab emoting scenes. Yeah. The 21st century would say that Kirk Douglas can't act. The, the 21st century would dismiss Burt Lancaster. Mm. These, and, and that's the generation that Shatner came from. So if you watch him on Boston Legal, if you watch him in uh, Judgment at Nuremberg, he even has a movie, he has a movie that came out just this year. He's 90. He has a movie, a romance, <laughs> a rom-com. Uh, he's, he's tremendous. In. It's amazing. Tremendously good. Funny effective never misses a beat always delivers his lines yeah even touching it's just a wavelength he didn't change his wavelength for the new sensibilities he's 90 and still sharp as attack i mean it's pretty amazing um and actually you know i would you wouldn't think coming from him and you know we know he has an ego and everything else uh when he makes trek documentaries they're usually pretty good and thoughtful actually uh, surprise you know just just with shatter's personality you expect them to be more ego stroking or you know but yeah. they're not really they're actually or you expect him to good. crap all over it right he yeah was, he had yeah. that famous comedy routine 40 years ago where he said yeah right girl get a life that sort of thing <laughs> but he doesn't do that in any of his right. later documentaries he doesn't do that he knows perfectly well that he's captain kirk yeah and captain kirk is an immortal part of culture as long <laughs> as western culture exists how many actors get to do that yeah right i mean Kirk Douglas could say, I am Spartacus. No matter what else I've done in my career, I am Spartacus. But what can Burt Lancaster say? A great actor. What can he say? Yeah. Like that. <laughs> it doesn't happen to everybody, is what I'm trying to say. Right, no, you know, so the actors who are smart enough to lean into it when it does, mm -hmm. I mean, how much how would you feel if you were James Earl Jones? He's absolutely inextricably part of our culture, but not his face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, the not, not his acting <laughs> at all. It's, it's, he, he would have been a fool to turn his back on that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just merciless. And Shatner knows it. He knows it perfectly well. I think he knew it right around Star Trek V. It was where he started to think, I'm not going to fight this at all. Yeah. This is better to be immortal, even if it's you know not for what I would have wanted, than to not be immortal at all. <laughs> I guess. When... So you, you bring up something that I think would be a good way to kind of like start wrapping up the conversation um, and talking about not just Trek fiction, I think especially in the 1980s, but also fan culture. I'm um, amazed to hear that there's been a conversation. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just assumed it was me. <laughs> but I, I think about... You knew um, that, right? You both yeah. knew that. <laughs> <laughs> but... I think it's very well known. You mentioned that that sketch that Shatner did uh, where basically told a Trek fan to get a life, right? I think that was the, the gist of it. Um, and I've seen like some of the clips of like some of the other actors that were part of the original series, not the main cast. I'm talking about like side actors, you know, uh, that played like one episode roles. Um, but sometimes they are very oblivious or they're not understanding of Trek fandom. Uh, and sometimes they're even contemptuous of it. Uh, so you kind of came up through the convention culture, right? Uh, <laughs> I did. I mean, do, do you have any thoughts or experiences that you could share as far as like, you know, I mean, it's, it's come 180 degrees now, you know, geek fandom, Trek culture, all that stuff. It, you wear it unabashedly on your sleeve, really, no matter what rank you're from, uh, you know, and it's, it's widely accepted and almost never ridiculed at this point. But that wasn't what it was in the 80s, especially. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? And maybe, you know, we can start also tying the conversation towards Trek fiction again to wrap it up. It was, but... it was a black and white moment. The actress who plays the Romulan commander in the Enterprise incident 
we meet a female Romulan commander. She is every bit the equal of the men in the episode. In yeah. fact, she's a superior. She commands a ship group instead of just a ship. And her crew is loyal to her. She's outsmarted in the end, but she is a, a fully fleshed out, wonderful character. And the actress who played her was approached by a fan group in Houston saying, we're, we're having a convention. We expect 5,000 people. We'd like you to show up as a guest. And she said, why? And they said, because you played the Romulan commander in the Enterprise incident. And she not only didn't remember that role, she didn't remember Star Trek. Wow. She'd, had, she'd been in everything. Yeah. And she thought, what? I, I, was in, I was a guest star in one episode of one TV show and you want me to come to your convention? And there, the, the apocryphal telling of this tale is that she was disdainful when she heard that. And then they said, yeah, we'd like you to come to the convention. We'll pay your airfare and $500. And she said, what? <laughs> I'm there. I love Star Trek. <laughs> Same thing with the guy who played Apollo in Who Mourns for Adonis. He was told, I, what? Star what? <laughs> and oh, I vaguely remember playing a Greek god. We'll pay your airfare and give you $500 to just stand in a booth and greet people. <laughs> that's when everything changed. That's when all of a sudden, I think that's when a lot of the disdain went away. Unfortunately, it didn't have anything to do with cultural importance it had to do with just plain money mm -hmm. you know these these are bit part actors and most of them didn't go on to anything so so you know if a convention is offering them airfare food lodgings and money that's how i think the conventions be, really took off because even the main characters in the original star trek weren't willing to turn that down right i mean can you name anything else you have ever seen michelle nichols in yeah no, no. you can't yeah. but she's she was an actress her whole life <laughs> she was an actress for 50 years after the original Star Trek. So in the 1970s, what could she hope for? That maybe Bill Shatner would give her a guest star on <laughs> T.J. Hooker? Well, I would say, at least for Nichelle Nichols, she did have a pretty prominent role in trying to get women in NASA uh, in the 70s, right? Didn't she? She was kind of the face of yeah. that campaign. Okay, well, what about Walter Koenig? You know? Yeah. He certainly didn't have, none of them had any roles right. after this. Mm -hmm. Walter Koenig is playing Chekhov on internet only Star Trek fan fiction. Yeah. That's being yeah. filmed right now. He's, he's in it. He's in an ongoing show right now with a whole bunch of other characters who don't get work. They just, yeah. they just don't get work. Most actors don't. So I think that's what caused the convention scene to explode is that suddenly <laughs> you could get everybody to come to your convention. <laughs> you <know? laughs> I think that's where it helps that it was, it had its roots in television. Uh, where television actors weren't going to be pulling in as much clout or money as movies act movie actors would anyway. Yeah, it's almost unheard of that somebody who starred in a Star Trek iteration of any kind will go on to do anything that's radically different. Mm -hmm. That's almost unheard of. Even now, it's almost unheard of. I mean, Kate Muldar, or rather, uh, uh, Kate Mulgrew, Captain of the Enterprise then goes on to star in Orange is the New Black, you know, yeah. a, and a completely different character, completely different, and it's wonderful. So all of a sudden the fans are saying, okay, well, I don't even know you were in Star Trek, but I love you in this, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. But that almost never happens, almost <laughs> never. And the number of times that somebody from a Star Trek franchise goes on to become a beloved cultural icon, yeah. even fewer, even fewer. I mean, LeVar Burton, that's pretty much it. I mean, yeah. can you name anybody else? I, I can't think of anybody yeah. else. Uh, Patrick they, Stewart, I think, definitely. Oh, right. Patrick Stewart. Yes, yeah, 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 definitely yeah. Patrick Stewart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michael, were you a part of fandom at all in the 80s? Like, going through? Do you even Did remember was... the 80s? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I remember the 80s. Oh, yes. Um, I remember I went to one Star Trek convention. Just one. And... Uh, I had gone to comic book conventions, but the conventions back then, I remember being much smaller. They didn't have all the corporate nonsense that are in them now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember the Star Trek convention I went to was really fun. It was just a bunch of fans and their little booths and their photographs and stuff like that. And Patrick Stewart was there and he came and spoke. And it was a good time. Uh, not like the monster gigantic things that conventions have become. I yeah. mean, they're just, they're nothing like they were. So conventions, just in general, any kind of convention I think was probably more fun in the eighties. 
I mean, most things were more fun in the eighties. Let's be honest. Um, <laughs> fan, fan culture. I remember being more enjoyable. Um, we didn't have the internet. So everything was like fanzines and, <laughs> you know, star log magazine is when you'd find stuff out. I mean, it was, it yeah, was much was, different. There was no concept then of what yeah. we now know as toxic fandom. Right. That that happened now. That would yeah. exist then. That I think that could only exist the way it does now with the internet. Um, yeah. It's it sucked some of the fun out of the whole thing. Some of definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Quite a bit of the fun out. If you yeah. know you're gonna get death threats if you like one character instead of another. <laughs> yeah, I just don't <laughs> I don't get some of that. It's no me neither. Weird. But yeah. <laughs> But I, I remember that that convention was a lot of fun. Just a lot of nerdy people like me, and <laughs> it was just it was great. It was it was a it was a good time. Uh, the few times that I ever went to conventions, I just split off into a little side room just to talk about writing. Mm. We weren't there to to fan girl the the stars or anything. We did, weren't there for the panel discussions or anything like that. We were just there to talk about writing. It was all writing related from the beginning for me. So I guess uh, to start wrapping up here, um, you know, we're, we're coming to the close of our first month of Book Trek. Uh, you know, any highlights as far as this month is concerned for things that, uh, things that you read? I mean, especially if people haven't seen all of your individual videos or anything like that, but, uh, you know, anything that maybe you discovered or that you rediscovered that uh, is really sticking out to you? Well, I, I discovered that the Gold Key comics are just as weird now as they were when I was a little kid. Yeah. I remember reading those as a little kid going, this is all wrong. Why is this so wrong? Well, now I know why it's all so wrong, but it's still weird. It's still a weird thing. I picked up a and, couple Gold Key issues uh, just a couple of weeks ago at a comic shop, but luckily they were from the later years. Mm -hmm. They were like from the mid 70s. So they actually had like Trek down. They actually felt like Trek episodes by that point. They weren't yeah. like some surreal fever dream version of trek <laughs> but you you were you were rereading the bullish stuff right yeah yeah and which was which was fun it was better than i thought it would be and it was kind of interesting just to see how different some of those episodes were in story form than they were broadcast and particularly the the most interesting thing was the first was star trek one the first book with spock the volcanian and yeah. everybody distrusting Spock. I mean, Scotty didn't like Spock. And like, it was just, it was just weird. You can tell he hadn't seen the show. And so there was a time when people hadn't seen Star Trek, which is weird in itself. And that was interesting. The only bummer for me this month was that I, I had so much else to read that I didn't get to read as much as I wanted. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to Star Trek, or Book Trek 2022. <laughs> <laughs> be able to prepare a little bit more too for it yeah exactly right? yeah yeah the, the thing that i read you you were kind enough to send me the copy i have it next to me here of spock must die uh by blish and i thank you for that uh You're you know it, i have read not all of them but i've read some of his adaptations of the shows and he, he's a capable writer um i enjoyed this more than i thought i was going to um it, it kind of it does feel like a fast-paced episode it's got some interesting ideas but i did get the sense and i talked about this a little bit in my video that he was more cynical as far as people's abilities to overcome prejudices uh than roddenberry was um you you were talking about the prejudice against spock and that which is we see that occasionally in the original series but not to that degree um right. and this one i saw a little bit too like you know he, he seemed highly skeptical that people were really going to be over to overcome their racial prejudices, which again, he wrote this in 1969. So I kind of understand that, you know, uh, this is just after King was assassinated and everything. Um, but it is interesting to go from one person's vision of the future, you know, being translated into somebody else's who doesn't maybe necessarily buy into everything. Um, well, Bl Blish's, Blish's sense of the future would be a lot different, I think. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it, he was an interesting choice to, to write those, but I thought, you know they were decent for what they were mm -hmm. i was pretty i was pretty uh, happy with them i had a good time reading them <laughs> i would like to get on to some original novels so i am kind of looking forward to uh 
this coming month with the next generation. Yeah, and he was basically Trek fiction officially, right? For a long time. Until like the mid 70s. Mm -hmm. um, you know, aside from all the fan stuff and the slash fiction and <laughs> everything else that was being created. And then the other two big names in Trek fiction in the 70s, right, were Sandra, uh, Sandra Marshak and Myrna Colbreth. Right. Which I know, Steve, you have a soft spot for uh, Order of the Phoenix, I think. Right. Uh, I've talked to those two many, many times <laughs> in many, many little rooms of what would later become conventions. <laughs> oh. Interesting. Uh, the only thing that I've read, because I, I know that they were also instrumental in gathering fan fiction into collections, uh, which I do want to um, read that stuff. I did read Triangle. I, I, I'm, I'll be posting a video, uh, I think, on Tuesday for it. I got to say, I did not like it. <laughs> <laughs> um too many uh too many i think old tropes that maybe got past the lawyer phase that shouldn't have uh, the lawyers were hardly involved oh uh, yeah when, when star trek was timescape the lawyers were hardly involved. well this one came out in 1983 so i was surprised that this was i was finding as much of it in here as i was when they move um, over to pocketbooks then you stop getting any of that mm. but in, when it's timescape you can still see it it's still there and <laughs> son of Trek and Myrna Kalbreth came straight out of that fan world and they could never write without it. I think that's why they stopped writing because yeah. they couldn't do without it. They couldn't write to the new kind at all. <laughs> but those are basically the three names, right? That people who were reading Trek fiction in the seventies would have known, right? Blish, Marshak and Colbreth. Were there others that people would have been familiar with? AC Crispin, Vonda McIntyre. They were involved really early on. They may not have published okay. as much until later but they were involved. They never missed. They were in all the conversations. Hmm. Uh, but uh, they adapted well to the to the lawyer phase yeah. of Star Trek. They, they yeah. wrote classics for the lawyer phase of Star Trek. So, Steve, what about you for this past month? Just so we can maybe end maybe on some of your some of your highlights from the month. Oh well, for me, the the highlight of the month has been that I'm talking about this this uh, series Bible, sort of a straitjacket that comes in where suddenly more and more the more popular and profitable the movies are the less the writers can do in their fiction. You can't maim anybody anymore. You can't make somebody crazy anymore. You can't have characters, you know, fall into bed and describe it explicitly anymore. You can't do any of that anymore. And for a long time, I thought, okay, well, that's really gonna, you know, that's gonna narrow the pendulum swing to just this. And what I've noticed is just like a, like a formal Shakespearean sonnet, you can have those strong strictures and still get a lot of interesting stuff done. I don't think I was paying attention the first time around to the little nuances that you could work into a book, even though you had that Bible that you had to obey. Mm -hmm. I've, I've encountered a couple of, a few books this month where, that did that a lot better than I remember. Some of them not, <laughs> but, yeah. but a lot of them, a lot of them, <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm uh, a part of me is sorry that I'll be leaving that experiment behind. Uh, but the experiment for next generation is even better because I was hate reading those books. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, going at them now completely open-mindedly will be a revelation who knows what i missed the first yeah time. i think even with that straight jacket what i find is if they either have a really interesting maybe scientific premise that they're exploring or if the character stuff is really good yeah. you know if the characters feel like the characters i don't really mind that the story's not as great um just because i'm as a fan i'm reading and you know i'm enjoying it like you know i think one of the novels from this month for me was the lost years and it takes like a hundred pages or so to for the plot to kick in right uh and there are some great scenes but but the the character stuff is great yeah. like it felt like the characters um so i don't mind it necessarily if did if you go the to the lost years straight from triangle or did you go to triangle from the lost years triangle was the last one that i read actually um, so that's why I made sure to also I've got them all next to me, you know. In in I Triangle, you're still in the well. fictional world of Star Trek where you're bound to see Kirk in mesh underwear. <laughs> 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 Things like that don't happen in the lost years. <laughs> in 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 Triangle, you are bound to have Spock and Kirk passionately professing their friendship for each other. <laughs> really yeah. passionately professing their in, friendship. In Triangle, we have an extreme Mary Sue, and Kirk spends most of the time falling unconscious and being carried in the strong arms of men. <laughs> that's and that's the, a lot of Triangle. In Triangle, <laughs> and in a lot of their the that duo's other fiction, the Vulcan mind melds that Spock does with Kirk. They're passionate. <laughs> <laughs> they really, really read like sex scenes. Yeah. 
let's just put it that way yeah they really read like sex scenes and way too often even when it's not part of the plot when they they write a scene like that a mind meld scene like that way too often kirk is kind of resistant (laughs) and his resistance is overcome and yeah. he's grateful for it. It becomes yeah. a metaphor. All that stuff. All that stuff belongs in the becomes a metaphor thing. for a whole different thing. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I read it and loved it when it was the only Star Trek to read. But I, yeah. like I've said, I'm glad that we don't have to deal with that anymore. I'd rather. <laughs> I prefer the straitjacket if it gets rid of yeah. scenes like that. I just reread the Prometheus design, and there's a, a scene like that right at the beginning. It's totally gratuitous. Yeah. It's just the writers getting off. That's all. <laughs> You know, you 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 have the the distinct impression that there's an unedited version of that book somewhere uh, that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that right would have so. a very different rating. Yeah. <laughs> Although, I know where they were coming from. Is the yeah, thing. you I actually spoke to them and knew. From. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the episode there's an episode of the original series where Kirk loses his memory, thinks he's a Native American, falls oh, yeah. in love with a young woman named Miramani. Paradise. He or? Can't get her out yeah. of his mind. And at the end of the episode, he's asleep at his desk in his quarters. And McCoy says, if only he could forget her. Then McCoy leaves. Spock walks over to the unconscious sleeping Kirk, initiates a mind meld and says the word forget. Yeah. That is just so incredibly subjective. It's so suggestive. <laughs> Usually networks, when they were rebroadcasting that episode in reruns, cut that part out. Did they really? Wow. It's right there. You can see it. And it's yeah. unbelievable. I mean, think <laughs> about what that means. <laughs> that, that's the world they were coming from. Right. Better by far <laughs> to, leave it, to leave it all behind. <laughs> so I think we probably a good spot to start wrapping it up here. Um, you know, I think that we've we've hit the different uh, interesting points of Trek's timeline as far as the original series goes, uh, the good and the bad. Um, you know, a little bit of on-screen conversation, a little bit of a fictional conversation, but uh, I hope whoever is watching this enjoys it. Uh, I've definitely enjoyed this conversation. I've enjoyed uh, having these two gentlemen as co-hosts in this book Trek, and I look forward to uh, four more months of this. Um, and I especially look forward to Steve coming to terms and coming around on next gen <laughs> that's going to be the most interesting thing yes <laughs> well, i want to i want to ask are we going to have a discussion at the end of the next generation but i know you and michael will say oh no no we're not and then you'll have one <laughs> you'll just if the, you'll get all the hosts to say oh no i'm sorry we can't do it <laughs> I'll, I'll just be what day are you busy again yeah that's the day that we're gonna have yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, no sorry. Technical difficulties. We can't have. A... <laughs> no, but see, I know that you'll be fair and open-minded, and that you'll you, you'll give it, you know, <laughs> another chance as much as you can. Um, you know, Michael and I, I think are already sold on that series, right? <laughs> it t- it took a while for me, mm. actually. It well, the first two years. seasons are not good, yeah. so that's understandable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but okay, so I think that's a good place to stop. Um, so thank you, everybody, for watching uh and again we'd love to hear your comments and uh please check out the uh hashtag book trek 2021 uh see all the great videos that people are posting and it's not too late to join uh we still oh, have definitely more join us for next month yeah next month is where the fun starts <laughs> <laughs> no definitely join us for september all right thank you everybody